welcome to Community Conversation, the show that's for and about the people who live in Reading. My name is Kevin Vent, and I'm going to be your host for this episode. And in this episode, we have some public safety officials with us. We have new Reading Police Chief Mark Sagala here in studio. But first, we have Reading Fire Lieutenant Mark Dwyer here with us. Let's listen in on that conversation now. Well, hello, I'm here with Lieutenant Mark Dwyer of the Reading Fire Department. Nice to have you here, Mark. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to be here. Well, it's good to have you, and uh, you've been with the Reading Fire Department for how long? For, I'm in my 28th year. 28 years, and you've been a lieutenant for how long? Been a lieutenant for about 11 years. Okay, excellent. And now, some people may find this interesting, you're not actually based at the main Reading Fire Station, though, are you? No, I'm, I'm based on Rubin Street. That's where they have the lieutenants. Okay, yeah. A lot of people, I think, some, sometimes forget the extra fire station is there on Rubin Street. I mean, right. I'm sure the people that live near it don't, and they're yep, very the great. The people on the west side like having it there. Like having it there, but, you know, it's, that's interesting to hear. So one of the reasons we brought you here today is because you've been going and doing um, a number of presentations for different groups around town about some fire safety concerns. What are some of the groups that you've been presenting to and working with? Well, uh, this is a, 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 a presentation that's, that's uh, geared toward the seniors. Okay. So I work with the older adults and mm -hmm. talk about uh, fire safety, fall safety, smoke mm -hmm. detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, okay. those kinds of safety issues. Sure. And what are some of the specifics maybe you share first about smoke detectors and carbon uh, monoxide uh, well, detectors? Well, you know, smoke, having, having working smoke detectors are, are, is a really critical uh, it's a critical life-saving device, mm -hmm. and in the state of Massachusetts so far this year, there have been 19 fire deaths, mm -hmm. and about half of those um, have, there have been no, no working smoke detectors, right. Right. or the smoke detectors are there, but they malfunction, okay. or the smoke detectors are there, but they have no batteries in them. Okay. So what recommendations do you make to the people about their smoke detectors to ensure that they work and function or have batteries, et cetera? Well, if there's any message I could, you know, get out there to the community, it would simply be that, you know, we're here to, to, to help you. So, you know, sure. we want to make sure that everybody has this protection because right. it's life-saving protection and you just, you can't afford to be without it. Right. So how often should someone uh, test their smoke detector to see that it works? Um, the Department of Fire Services recommends that, that detectors are tested monthly. Okay. Okay. and that the batteries are, are tested when we change the clocks. It's okay. the change your clock, change your battery. All right, so every time in the fall and in the spring when we go to do the fall back or spring forward, we should be changing the batteries in our smoke detectors too. That's right. And if someone doesn't know how to te test their smoke detector, I notice you have one here. How, what's the best way to test a smoke detector to see if well, it works? Well, there's a button right on the, right on the detector, and, it, and it's simply a test button, and you just hold the button in, yep. and it will, it will, you know, generally beep three times and let you know that it's been tested okay. and that it's working and that's what you want to do. Okay. So one of the things that happens with smoke detectors also is I know that they do have um, a lifetime that even though you may change the batteries every six months or what have you or, and you may test it every month, what is the approximate lifetime of a, of a, of a unit before it really should be changed in your home? Um, they're good for 10 years. Okay. Okay. And um, that's because the contaminants in the air and so forth wear away the interior components of the detector itself. Okay. And where can someone buy new smoke detectors if they need to? You can buy detectors at Home Depot, at Lowe's, at any, um, you know, any business. Any that, hardware store. Sure. Or what Walmart, Target would have? Walmart, detectors. Target, absolutely. Okay, all right, that's good. Now, notice you also have a carbon monoxide detector here, too. What is the difference between a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide direct detector? Well, carbon monoxide is a, is, it's a silent killer. It's, it's, it's odorless, tasteless gas. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, back in 2006, uh, Nicole Garofalo passed away from, was the young girl that, that created the, the uh, carbon monoxide um, law. Okay. And what happened was during the winter, the snow had, had uh, a drift had, had blocked, her, blocked the, the exhaust. Okay. And the carbon monoxide entered the house. Had built up in the house. Right. And, and, and that's the scary part about not having carbon monoxide detection sure. is that it's a silent killer. Sure, sure. And I know it's a law, as you said, now in Massachusetts that every home is supposed to have one. That's correct. Um, they, should, they should be on, on every habitable uh, floor of your dwelling. Okay. And approximately, again, do they need to be tested on a monthly basis? Yeah, you can like test those also on a, on a monthly basis. This particular one here, if in fact it went into alarm, it has a vis uh, visual display. Okay. So it would tell you you know, All right. what to expect. And if there was a low battery, it would, mm -hmm. you know, tell you LB for low battery. Sure. So if you read the directions and you know how it works, right. you'd know. 
So one of the things that also happens, especially during the winter time, uh, is that particularly senior citizens, again, get cold in their homes and they use uh, uh, electric uh, space heaters and that kind of thing. I know there are some right. kind of rules you want people to follow about using electric space heaters in the home. That's right. Um, space heaters are extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. And um, there was actually uh, there was actually a, um, a fire in, in, in Wales, uh, Massachusetts, back in February, uh, that originated with a space heater and an and a older woman was, was killed. Okay. Okay. Um, and by the way, she had no smoke alarms in her house. Mm. Um, there, so, you, you need to keep a space of three feet. Okay, that's what I was going to okay, ask. Any to, tips about using them? Yeah, yeah. you, you want to keep them three feet away okay. uh, from any combustible, uh, any, any type of combustible. Uh, you make you want to make sure that they're UL listed. Sure. Uh, you want to make sure they're the type that if they fall over, they'll automatically turn off. Oh, that's a good okay. tip. I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> you want to make sure you want to plug them directly into an outlet. Okay, so no extension. No cords extension or like cords that. or anything. So like that. you know, if we go to the wide shot here in the studio right now, we actually have a unit here. So we this do. would actually be incorrectly placed because that's it's correct. too close to the couch. That's correct. <laughs> you think about what three feet is. Right. And that's about how far away you want that to be sure. from anything that's combustible. Sure, sure. And as we know, couches and pillows and that kind of thing uh, are combustible. One of the things that I know you do is you show some videos, too. And we have a video clip we want to show now uh, that, though it's not one that you show, it's very dramatic to show how quickly um, a couch or something can catch on fire in a house and how much time you actually have to get out of the home when, uh, if a fire were to occur. So we're going to go ahead and take a look right. at that video now. It was actually produced by the Today Show That's right. um, this past winter. And so we want to take a look. Let's take a look at that video clip right now. It starts small, but in just minutes, flames can engulf your entire house. I didn't think we were going to make it. In an instant, your home becoming a deadly trap. In 20, 30 seconds, it went from no fire in the hallway to the stairs were blazing. Even firefighters are overcome. <laughs> and your chance to get out alive is getting shorter and shorter. Research shows 30 years ago, you had about 17 minutes to escape. Today, it's only three to four minutes. Turns out there's a reason newer homes burn faster. You know the old saying, they don't build them like they used to? Well, they don't build them like they used to. And to show you, we've come here to Chicago. It's a lab where we're going to do a demonstration. I'm wearing this hard hat and these safety glasses so we stay safe. They have two rooms built here side by side. The first one is sort of a flashback to the 70s or 80s, the way homes used to be built. Real wood on the coffee table, more natural fabrics. But if you come just next door, this room probably looks the way your home looks right now. Modern furniture, a lot of synthetic fibers from the curtains to the couch, even to the coffee table. Table. Experts say newer homes can burn five times faster than the older ones. So we're going to light up the modern room first and see what happens. Let's go. Within seconds, flames are already shooting up from the pillow. Just seconds later, it's spreading to the entire couch. The backing on your carpet is synthetic. Your drapes are synthetic. The couch, the pillows are synthetic. And they're more flammable than the way they used to be. They burn hotter and faster than natural materials do. So why do they make it out of that stuff? It's less expensive. It's the way homes are furnished today. There's no getting away from that. In less than two minutes, the fire jumps to the lamp and the end table. Black smoke filling the room. By two minutes, 20 seconds, watch. That chair goes up in flames. At two minutes and 40 seconds, it's the coffee table. And then this. Complete flashover. You can't survive this. The fire's coming out of the roof. Yeah, there. Should let, we leave? Yeah, let's get out of here. All right. Jeez, get out of here. That was fast. All right, now we're going to light the older home up to see the difference. Are we good to go here? Good to go. All right, let's get out of here. The sparks up. Two minutes pass, and the fire is still barely noticeable. I'm just amazed this pillow has been on fire for several minutes now, but it hasn't even caught the rest of the couch. It could be the difference between life and death, and it's been proven many times. At five minutes, the flames are just peeking over the top of the pillow. Ten minutes, only the corner of the couch is burning, and the drapes are catching. At 15 minutes, the room is still intact. It's been 26 minutes, and take a look. The fire is still mostly contained to the couch. It hasn't even spread to this table. It hasn't spread to the plant or even the coffee table. And the fact that you can see me right now and we can stand here, 
the black smoke is not overpowering. It's taken this long. You could still get out. In the end, it takes 30 minutes for the old house to burn. The modern house, less than three. So what's being done about it? The Furniture Industry Group telling NBC News it supports a federal flammability standard for upholstered furniture, but only if product changes are safe, effective, and affordable. Until then, experts say there's no time to waste. That's why when your smoke alarm goes off, you don't have time to look around to get your wedding pictures. Get out. You get out as quickly as you can, Jeff. Well, that was some dramatic video there, Mark, wasn't it? It is. Um, particularly to see the difference in burn rates between what we'll call a, an older couch or an older living room and, and, a, and, a, and a new set like the furniture we have here. That's right. The difference between three minutes and 30 minutes is really dramatic. It's, it, it's, it's terribly dramatic. It, it, it really drives home the point that I also try to drive home that you don't have a lot of time right. in the event of a fire today. All of this furniture is synthetic. It's really made of oils. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the petroleum products and so forth will, will burn quicker. Right. They'll burn with, with, with toxic gases, and they'll yeah. overcome you very quickly. And you saw the black smoke just billowing out of that first room that they lit on fire there and how quickly it filled with that black smoke. And that's really the danger in, in, a, in a fire is, is the smoke there. Absolutely. It's not the fire that's really going to get you, although that happens. Yeah. But, but, you know, it, it, it's the smoke. And that's why, you know, we talk about practicing a, an escape right. plan, having sure. two ways out. Uh, you know, having the things that you need close by, right. whether, you know, your phone, anything you need to call 911, whatever it might be, right. you need to have it there and you need to be able to get out quickly. And anything, as I said at the end of the video also, is, is anything you might want to grab your wedding photos or anything like that, just leave them and get out just of the house. Just leave them there. Once yeah. you're out, stay out. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's and, good. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I happen to bring a candle when we're talking about you know yes, fires. I mean, you and, can see that. And 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 that is actually an, an electric candle. You know, okay. there, there's a lot of things about candle safety. We, we've sure. had, I've been involved in in many candle fires in in, in town, but. Um, you know, that's a great alternative. You can't even tell that it's right. not a real candle. Right, and it gives some of the similar ambiance that a, can that a, you know, a, a traditional wax candle sure. gives at the same time. I know another thing you talk about is uh, safety in the kitchen. Uh, right. Maybe one or two tips for safety in the kitchen that we share. Right, you know, we have, the, the, there's two big, um, there's, there's two big uh, uh, messages we want to send. It's stand by your pan. Okay. And, okay, stand by your pan. And what does that mean? It means basically when you're cooking in the kitchen, don't leave the kitchen. Mm, you know, you okay. want to stay w with whatever you're cooking and uh, make sure that you just don't leave. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other one is uh, put a lid on it. Uh, I actually got a pan here. If, if we were cooking here, um, what we recommend while you're cooking is, is simply just have a pan with you so that if a fire happens, you can just right. slide that cover right over the pan because with, with fire you need three things. You need fuel, heat, and oxygen. Right. If you cover it, you're eliminating the oxygen, then you can turn off the heat, yeah. you're good to go. And one of the mistakes that people make, particularly because they cook with oils and grease and that kind of thing, is they try to use water on a, on a, on a stove to put out the fire. And that's one of the worst things you can do. You do not want to do that. And because why is that? that? Because yeah. that will splatter and, and spread the fire. And once it gets spread, you're, you're going to be out of luck. You're going to be you're in deep trouble. So, so uh, um, stand by your pan. That's right. And keep, keep a lid on it. Keep a lid on it. All right, right. Those are the two tips for cooking in the kitchen. Right. That's excellent. Any last minute things you just want to share with us about some fire safety that you uh, share with people as you go around town? I, I do. I just want to drive home the fact that, you know, there's been a number of, uh, uh, of fires this year in Massachusetts. I said mm -hmm. there, there, there's been, you know, uh, you know, 19 fire deaths. Right. And, you know, half of those were because, you know, there were no working smoke detectors. Um, you know, uh, you know, Attleboro, um, you know, uh, an older a woman was, was killed um, and she was burned, you know, badly. Uh, Fitchburg, um, smoke alarms didn't operate. Two women in their 60s are killed. Yeah. It, 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 it's the same. It goes on and on and on. It's but a similar kind of story. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the real message is that we want to make sure that people are protected with this kind of, with these devices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would ask that anybody who knows any neighbors or, 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 or older adults right. that, you know, you know, please 
check with them and make sure and, and call us on the fire department. Sure. We'd be glad to come in and, 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 and help, help and make them safe. And that's safe. good for people to know that the fire department would be willing to come in and help Absolutely. check their smoke detectors or whatever to make sure that everything is going on. That's okay. why I'm here. That's why you're here. Excellent. If someone um, was part of a group in town that wanted to have you come and share your presentation, how would they get a hold of you? They can call the fire station at 944-3132 okay. and ask for me. And we'll, we'll get it set up. All right. So call the fire department to ask for Lieutenant Mark Dwyer, and then we'll set something up there. Thank you for being here today on Community Conversation. My pleasure. And as we go to break here on Community Conversation, we actually have a fire safety PSA we'd like you to watch. We'll be back in just one moment here on RCTV. Over 10 years, how many things have you replaced? Fridge, toaster, stove, washer, dryer, maybe even your water heater. What about this? No? Well, you should. After 10 years, smoke alarms need to be replaced. The more you know, the safer you'll be. Find out more at mass.gov slash DFS. Smoke alarms, a sound you can live with. The only thing you can really do at the end of the day is compare a guy to his contemporary. Right. It's hard to compare Brady to Terry Bradshaw. The game was different in the 70s than it is now. They've won something like 15 or 16 more games than any other team in the NFL yep. in that span of time. Luck looks like an NFL quarterback. Um, I remember I called everyone I knew when they when they uh, traded for Garnett. Um, that was just one of the most amazing things <laughs> of my life. <laughs> if John Farrell could fix John Lester, then your pitching problem is partially solved. Kareem had that one unstoppable shot, the skyhook, and he milked it for what, 35,000 points or something like that? Just, again, versatility, Mr. Patriot. Yeah. If you needed something, he's going to get it done. I am to this show as Alex Baldwin is to SNL. So. <laughs> this is the infamous Jason Barrett that shoves uh, his glove yes. right into Alex Rodriguez's face. <laughs> Welcome back to Community Conversation. Let's listen up now as new Reading Police Chief Mark Sagala shares with us here in studio. Well, hello, I'm here with Mark Sagala, who is the newly appointed police chief for the town of Reading. Nice to have you here today, Chief. Well, thanks for having me here today. Thank well, you I'm much. glad that you're able to take a few minutes out of your busy schedule and uh, talk with us a little bit about who you are and where you've come from and how you became chief and all that. So I guess I would start off by asking kind of how long have you been a police officer? I've been a police officer for 21 years. 21 years. And have you been in Reading the entire time? No, I actually worked in Burlington, Vermont for probably a little over a year. I okay. started right after I went to college at ULO, went mm -hmm. up to Burlington, Vermont. Uh, I trained there with the academy, and uh, then I was called off the list for Reading in 96, and I, uh, June of 96, I came back to Reading. Okay, excellent. So uh, you've been in town now as a police officer for how many years again? Put that together for us? Coming up on 20 years About in the town. About 20 of years yeah, in town. In June will be 20 years. In June will be 20 years. And so uh, with the retirement of the past chief, uh, there was an open position. Um, yes, sir. What did you do to, to get the position? How did you apply? What was the process there? So I uh, went out back, I think it was, I would say, probably September. Uh, the town manager put something out to the department and also to uh, to the whole, I think, the whole uh, state of Massachusetts asking sure. for anybody who's, who had at least five years, ten years as a police officer, five years of experience in a supervisory position mm -hmm. uh, who wanted to apply for the position of police chief right. and had a uh, whole job description. And um, I applied, put my resume in. I was the deputy chief for the last, at that point, for almost a year and a half in Reading. Okay. And uh, I put my resume in. And uh, they narrowed it down uh, to a, a list of candidates to go through an assessment center. Mm -hmm. uh, back in November, we, end of November, we went through an assessment center, several of us. And at that point, they made a decision, um, and uh, I was appointed. Excellent. So um, you know, you've been in town for over 20 years. You were the deputy chief before becoming the chief. Correct. What advantages do you see in kind of making that type of promotion for yourself in terms of your familiarity with the department and the town and that kind of thing? I think it helped a lot because of I had the, I had, quite honestly, I had the knowledge of what the chief did on a day-to-day -day basis prior to me sure. for the last couple of years to understand exactly what they were looking for in the town of Reading mm -hmm. and what uh, how, what was expected from me as, as the chief. And mm -hmm. I think that really helped, obviously, in their decision-making process. Okay. So what attracts you to a town like Reading being the police chief as opposed to maybe a larger city or something like that? For me, it's because I've, I've grown up here since right. I was 10 years old. Right. And I thought it was a place I always wanted to work for this town and be a member. I'm a member of the community. I still live in the community. And I really wanted to be a part of the community. I thought the best way to do it uh, was being a police officer in this type of environment. Sure, sure. So do you consider it an advantage to living in town while serving as chief at the same time? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of advantages. I think there could be some disadvantages depending upon uh, your makeup, 
But I think for myself, living in town is a, is a wonderful experience. Uh, having my children grow up in town, my wife's yeah. uh, obviously my wife's from town as well. <laughs> so uh, we and I, it's funny. I really don't go far on the weekends. I'm pretty much around Reading. Right. So what? Describe for me, maybe you know, in a nutshell, what is the basic job description of the police chief? Obviously, you supervise the functions of the police department, but what is, what does that entail? I basically manage everything that everything that happens in the police department, all the day-to-day -day activities. Uh, I manage, the town manager is the appointing authority for hiring, yep. but I uh, recommend any hiring. Uh, if there's any discipline that has to be done, obviously I have to recommend as well. Sure. Uh, any issues and any anything that comes up within this town, uh, law enforcement wise, is comes by my desk one way or, the, mm -hmm. or another. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful experience. It's a lot of responsibility, but in the long run, it's, it's, it's something I've always wanted to do since I was a young boy is to be right. a police officer and then as I got experience I really wanted to be a police chief. Hmm. Okay so in a supervisory role you're not necessarily going out on emergency calls day in and day out are you? No I'm a paper pusher at this <laughs> point most of the time. <laughs> now would you go out on a call if something you know Absolutely if there's something you know it comes there up. There's a major that, issue. Of course yeah. or if it happens in front of me I'm still a police officer right. so obviously yeah, you know anything that happens I will be right there at and any major uh, response that my department has to respond to I will be there with them sure. 24 hours a day my right. phone could never stops. But, uh, but in general, I allow the officers and the supervisors to handle the day-to-day -day activities. Right. But anything other than that, I will be there and right. be right there in front for them. You know, another uh, role would be being the public face of the, of the police department also. Kind of what, what does that entail? What, what is that like? That's just, every, I think you're right. Everybody knows that I go to, whether it's at market basket or whether right. it's walking <laughs> around the square, who I am, whether I'm working or whether I'm playing clothes, what I do on a you know, day to day basis. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. It's just something I, you know, I know I'm, I always have to be on. It's, it's something that when I'm around town, sure. people know me as the police chief. Sure. So, I, you know, not to say anything badly about the former chief, because I think he did an excellent job, but everyone who comes into a new role wants to make some changes or, or wants to kind of uh, tweak this or that based on their sure. experience and all that kind of thing. What are some of the things? that you see that uh, you would like to see changed or, or improved upon in the, in the Reading Police Department? Sure. So for a long time, we haven't had an honor guide, uh, which I believe is a real valuable tool. Quite honestly, for the community relations, I think it's great to have them at a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, town activities and town events. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I've decided, I've instituted another honor guide. I've had officers apply. I have okay. a 12-person honor guide that's going forward as of uh, last month. Mm -hmm. uh, they will be at the Memorial Day Parade. They will be at Veterans Day Services. Uh, any uh, fallen officers in, the, in Massachusetts, at least, I will be sending the honor guard to mm -hmm. their, uh, their um, uh, funerals or uh, ceremonies. Sure, sure. Um, I've also instituted our, our uh, community service officer. We had Officer Collins, who retired uh, back in January as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he left, I decided to change the job description. I met with the unions. And now I have a community service officer, which we went through a process to pick. It's Officer Kristen Stasiak. And she's going to be now to work administrative schedule Monday through Friday. And with her primary responsibility is being the, the liaison between the town businesses and the police department. Oh, okay. So her, she basically now goes around to all the businesses, the Rotary, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, anything like that, and, and to under, people understand what her role is, to, how we can help the businesses out, and how we can help you know, interrelate with the community sure. and the police department sure. is what her role is now. Sure. Now, obviously, your, one of your primary roles is, is safety as well and overseeing safety issues in town. Absolutely. Um, whether it be traffic safety or pedestrian safety or, or uh, anything like that. Any kind of uh, tweaks or changes or things we're going to be looking for in those areas? I just have, uh, I think, with her, her taking on the role she took on, Officer Savio, who's the uh, sorry the safety officer, he's going to be more involved now in a lot of the event planning mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, uh, all the uh, all the construction projects we have around town. Okay. He's been very involved for a while, but I want to make him even get more indebted into the, I'm sorry interrelated with those causes. Sure, sure. So um, there would be involvement in things like the Reading Fall Street Fair and those kind of things as well, just to help Correct. provide for the safety end. Of Absolutely, it. he'll be doing the safety, and Kristen will be running any of the uh, community uh, program part with with the police department at those events as well. Now, one of the things you also do is represent the department for official functions like selectman meetings and, and whatever, those types of things, government functions. So maybe talk to us a little bit about what your role is in those things. Sure. So I just, I'm basically, I am the, uh, the front person for the police department at those events. For example, I was at FinCom last night, FinCom okay. last week. So anything when it comes to the budget uh, preparation, Anything, any issues they have regarding that they want the police department involved uh, with, I, I am there to answer their questions uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, to guide them in the right direction from, from the police department standpoint. Right. Obviously, you know, they, uh, they have their own views on different things, but I want to make sure right. they understand where we stand from the police department standpoint sure. on whatever issue it might be right. to deal with. Right. And one of the things I know that people will ask is, is when, as you said, building projects and things like that come up in town, they'll often ask for what does the police department feel about 
different issues like that, you know, right. not to put any particular project in mind, but, you know, kind of how do you address those kind of things? Again, we're, our biggest role on most of those projects is public safety. I right. want to make sure that there's enough parking for, for residents, yeah. enough uh, the, the traffic in front of the, the, the project, whatever it may be, is right. going to be, is going to flow easily. Uh, the construction hours when it comes to different projects, what they can work, what they can't work sure. per the town bylaws. Sure. So th those are our roles in those in those uh, in those type of events. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, what is the police department's role in terms of the schools now, also? Because I know there's a, there's a safety officer for the school as well. What kind of what is is the police department's role in interacting with the school department? Absolutely. So, for the last ten years, we've had a great relationship, a minimum of ten years, with the school department. Uh, we have a, a, a full-time school resource officer, mm -hmm. Officer Mike Mule, who's been there now for a couple of years doing the role. And we've had two others prior to him. Yep. Um, he's doing an outstanding job. He spends an awful lot of time at the high school. Um, and uh, he, he flows down after that into the middle schools, into sure. the elementary. Um, I did. I have asked my a proposal uh, for this budget for a second SRO. And I know uh, okay. the budget's tight right now. So right. Pro probably not going to get it this time around. But I'll continue to push for it because I really believe it's a vital thing for the middle schools to have an SRO whose primary responsibility will be to get to the kids at a younger age in yeah. the middle schools about yeah. different issues, whether it's drugs or violence or bullying or anything that they can deal sure. with. I would really like to have someone a little bit more into the schools uh, at the middle school ages, but I understand, sure. you know, we're working to do the best we can with what we have. Yeah. And I know one of your roles also has to do with uh, liaising with the uh, Reading um, Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what's been going on with that in terms of your role in that specifically. Sure. So my role as the police chief is to obviously uh, uh, be the the uh, liaison for the police department to the, the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Uh, they're an outstanding group. Erica McNamara does an outstanding job of running it. She's been running it now for, mm -hmm. I think, about seven years. Right. Um, we really, as I wanted, anything she wants us to do, we work hand in glove with her on a daily basis. She, her basically, her office is 20 feet from mine. So mm -hmm. any issues with, you know, any type of drugs or substance abuse, with kids, adults that we can deal with and help her out to, to partner with her, we right. do. And we, right. I think we work very well with her. Right. And I think they actually even put a sharps container in the in the police department. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. There's one in absolutely every every police car. Oh, okay. But we oh, also wow. have... Um, I didn't the, know that. <laughs> sorry, yeah. The prescription drugs we take in, I think we've taken in over a million pills now in the last several years that we've had the program going on. Wow. So from people's cabinets to our police station, instead of getting into the hands of, of young kids or or anyone else that doesn't right. need them, you know, from people's right. actual homes. Yeah, so, so just to be, so everybody who sees this understands is that if they have prescription drugs that are expired or expiring and they no longer need in their homes, they can bring them to the police department or... 24 hours a day, they can drop them off in the lobby of the police department. We'll, we'll, we'll dispose them at that point right. after that. So there's no, there's no problems with anybody getting them that shouldn't have them. Right, and also it keeps them from being um, into the water supply Absolutely. and that kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah, So it's both an environmental and a, and a drug safety concern. Yeah, what a question. Uh, so kind of as we're wrapping up here a little bit, obviously the opioid crisis and whatever in Massachusetts and in the whole area has been a big one, and it has been an area of concern here in Reading as well. What are some of the things as a, as a police department that you're doing to help kind of work with that issue in town beyond what our CASA is already doing? Sure. I, we're basically trying to get, to, again, I think one of the biggest things we deal with is education with the children, and I believe that's a really valuable tool to have the school resource officer deal, uh, talking to these youths right. at a younger age about the drug problem because I really believe if you get to a younger age with the education, maybe they won't actually go and, you know, do harm to themselves as they right. get older. Right. But, um, again, any, any, anyone that comes anyone that comes in the police department for help, we will gladly help them as best we can. Uh, you know, no questions asked. If mm -hmm. they need help to get to get clean and get sober, we will do everything we can to help them. Uh, right. Anybody who comes into our department, um, 24 hours a day sure. to, to help them out to get off the drugs. All right. Well, uh, we uh, appreciate your service to our town, and, and we uh, welcome you as the chief, even though you've been around for 20 years oh, or so thanks, in the sir. police department. And we thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, we've been here with uh, Chief Mark Zagala, who is the brand-new ch police chief here in the town of Reading. We'll be back in just one moment here on RCTV. Thanks for watching Community Conversation today. Thank you to Chief Sagala and to Lieutenant Dwyer for joining us here today. And you can be sure to look for our future episodes as well. Have a great day.